Now I want to show you how gravitational waves appear naturally out of the field equations. We will consider a weak gravitational field in vacuum. In a, a weak gravitational field, the space-time metric is almost Lorentzian, or if you want, Galilean, which means that g alpha beta is equal to era alpha beta plus some small perturbation that I will call h alpha beta. And this era alpha beta is the unperturbed g, so I can also call it g alpha beta zero. And we know that g alpha beta zero, or era alpha beta, is just equal to one minus one minus one minus one here on the diagonal. And then we have all zeros out of the diagonal. h alpha beta here is a very small quantity. In particular, this is also a tensor. This must be considered as a tensor. But all these components are small. Remember that when we want to consider the field equations, we have to calculate the Christoffel symbols and also the Ricci tensor. But if we consider the expression for gamma, beta, lowercase, gamma, and alpha here, these components are also very small because they are derivatives of g alpha beta. Therefore, in the Ricci tensor r alpha beta, we can neglect the two terms that are given by the products of these two symbols, the two Christoffel symbols, because they will contain infinitesimal quantities raised to the second power. And they will, of course, be negligible with respect to the first power. So I can consider just the first two terms of the Ricci tensor. And the first two terms of the Ricci tensor are the derivative of gamma, gamma alpha beta, with respect to x gamma minus d gamma gamma alpha gamma with respect to x beta. Because let me say that again, the terms that I would have here would contain products of gammas, something like this, and therefore I can neglect them because they will contain high order terms. Let me also rewrite this term. This is equal to, we have already done something like this in the first lecture where we reviewed the Christoffel symbol. So this was equal to one half d over dx beta, and I have g gamma delta, the inverse of g, dg delta gamma dx alpha. And we can also replace, instead of g gamma delta, I can replace g0 of gamma delta because the inverse is approximately equal to the Minkowski metric. I can neglect h for the inverse because it would multiply something that also contains h and it is quite small. Therefore, I'm going to neglect higher order terms here as well. So this can be rewritten as one half g0 gamma delta, a second derivative of h h delta gamma with respect to x beta with respect to x alpha. So in particular, I'm just putting this operator inside these square brackets here, and it will act only on the derivative of g delta gamma with respect to x alpha, because this will be a constant according to our approximation. This is also equal to one half del squared. Now let me define h without any subscripts, dx beta dx alpha. h is just defined as the contraction of h h delta gamma with the, the metric, the inverse metric. So it will be h delta gamma times g zero delta gamma, just like this. And therefore I have used this definition here. We also have to express this term here in terms of h. So we have d gamma gamma alpha beta dx gamma this is equal to the derivative with respect to x gamma of the Christoffel symbol, which we can write as one half g gamma delta dg delta alpha dx beta plus dg delta beta dx alpha minus dg alpha beta dx delta. And this is approximately equal to, I'm putting an approximation symbol just because I'm going to assume here that I can replace g delta gamma with uh, g zero delta gamma. I could have used this approximation symbol here as well, but doesn't really matter. So this is approximately equal to d over dx gamma one half g zero gamma delta. And then the derivative of g is just the derivative of h delta alpha because the other part is constant. The Lorentz metric is constant. dx beta plus dh delta beta dx alpha minus dh alpha beta dx delta. And this is equal to one half. Now I can take the derivative inside these parentheses and I can also multiply by the metric tensor to raise indices, the indices of these three tensors here. One half and I have del squared h gamma with an upper index alpha dx gamma dx beta plus del squared h gamma beta dx gamma dx alpha minus g0 gamma delta del squared h alpha beta with respect to dx gamma dx delta. Now I can simply substitute this expression for the derivative of this, and I can substitute the expression that I found here for this derivative here. So I can rewrite the Ricci tensor 
like this r alpha beta is one half del squared h gamma alpha with respect to x gamma x beta plus del squared h beta gamma with respect to x gamma with respect to x alpha minus del squared h with respect to x beta with respect to x alpha minus g zero gamma delta del squared h alpha beta with respect to x gamma x delta. Since we are in vacuum, this Ricci tensor should be equal to zero because in vacuum, the energy momentum tensor is equal to zero. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the sum of these three terms here. And if you take a look, we can rewrite it as the derivative with respect to x gamma of dh gamma alpha with respect to x beta plus the derivative of h gamma beta with respect to x alpha. And then I have minus the derivative of h with respect to x alpha times the Kronecker delta gamma beta. I can rewrite it like this. And let me do one more step. This is also equal to d over dx gamma, d over dx beta of h gamma alpha. Now I'm going to add a term here, minus one half h delta gamma alpha. I'm taking one half of this and I'm putting it inside this derivative. And therefore I have to change the subscript of this uh, Kronecker delta delta here plus d over dx alpha h gamma beta minus one half h delta gamma beta. This is quite interesting now because you can see that this tensor inside this parentheses is just the same as this one. And I can give it a name. I can call it psi, for example, psi subscript alpha superscript gamma. This is just psi subscript beta superscript gamma. Therefore, we can rewrite it like this. So we can take this derivative inside this uh, parentheses, this one and this one here. This can be written as d over dx beta of d psi alpha gamma dx gamma plus d over dx alpha d psi gamma beta dx gamma. And now, what happens if we impose d psi alpha gamma dx gamma equal to zero? Can we do that? This is the first question. And the next question would be, what happens to our equations? Well, the answer to the second question is actually very easy because you can see it here that these three terms would give me zero and therefore I would be left with only this term here equal to zero. So it will simplify a lot our equation to try to answer the first question. Can we do this without losing any generality? And the answer is yes. And let me try to explain why. This equation here implies the following. We have d over dx gamma of psi alpha gamma, which is h alpha gamma minus one half h delta gamma alpha. And this should be equal to zero. But this reminds us of something. In particular, let's rewrite the conservation of energy. For the conservation of energy, we have that d over dx gamma of the energy momentum tensor gamma alpha should be equal to zero because of the conservation of energy. We know that this is true. This happens in general relativity. In particular, in that case, we had the covariant derivative here, but in this case, we are in a weak gravitational field. So we can replace the covariant derivative with the ordinary Euclidean derivative. So this will be just d over dx gamma of the Ricci tensor gamma alpha minus one half delta alpha gamma times r. Here we can also replace this delta with g because when we have mixed indices this is also equal to g alpha gamma and this should be equal to zero but if you take a look these two equations have the same form so the role that h plays in this equation here is the same as the role that r plays in this other equation here but this is just a conservation equation so we are not going to lose any generality because from this equation, we cannot derive R. In order to derive R, we need the Einstein field equations. So that's where we can find R if we know the energy momentum tensor. So what I mean is that this equation does not determine uniquely the Ricci tensor. And therefore, since this one has the same form, this equation does not determine uniquely H alpha gamma. And it is not just one equation because this equation depends on one index. We have to sum over gamma, therefore gamma is just a dummy index, but we have four values that alpha can take. So we have four equations. We have four equations, but we also have a tensor that has multiple components, more than four. In particular, if we consider H alpha beta, and if we consider the fact that H alpha beta should be symmetric, it means that we have 10 independent components. So we have one, two, three, four on the diagonal, and also one, two, three here, another two here, and another one here, which gives me 10 independent components. So H is not determined uniquely, and it is still very general. 
So what we must satisfy is the following equation. We have G0 gamma delta del squared H alpha beta with respect to X gamma X delta equal to zero. Now, if we use the definition of G0 gamma delta, which is the Lorentz metric, we can find that this is just equal to one over C squared del squared over DT squared minus the Laplacian acting on H alpha beta equal to zero. But what is this? This is the D'Alembert operator, which sometimes is just denoted with this square here. So we have D'Alembert operator acting on H alpha beta equal to zero. What this tells us is that H alpha beta, which is the perturbation of the field, propagates as a wave with the speed of light, because you can see here that the speed of the wave here is just C. And this is a gravitational wave. 